Welcome to the Becoming Ageless podcast, where we engage in extended conversations to promote a youthful biological age and improved health span. I'm your host, Robin Lynn Fredericks, holistic and integrative health practitioner. Hello, you guys, and welcome to today's episode. I am truly honored today to be talking to Dr. Bill Andrews, molecular biologist, gerontologist, and founder of Sierra Sciences. You might recognize him from his research and the leading of his team to discover the enzyme telomerase, not to mention the various documentaries on longevity in which he's been featured in. I am in awe of calling both him and his wife by friends, which his wife, by the way, if you haven't seen it, was on episode three of Becoming Ageless and sharing her own motivational story. She is truly a breath of fresh air all on her own. In 1997, Bill was awarded second place as the National Inventor of the Year for his cancer research. And in the early to mid-1990s, while at Gerin Corporation, he led the research to discover both the RNA and protein components of human telomerase, which is the enzyme responsible for preventing telomere shortening in our reproductive cells. Presently, the main focus of Sierra Sciences is to find ways to produce telomerase and to lengthen telomeres in all of the cells of the human body, something you definitely want to know about. Today, we're going to focus our conversation around what is aging? How do we age and can we stop it? As well as a little bit about Sarah's sciences, the direction in which Dr. Andrews would like to see it moving, and how you might be able to get involved. If that's not enough, anyone who knows Bill knows that he is a long distance runner, so we'll be jumping into that conversation. I hope you enjoy the show and see you on the other side. Dr. Bill Andrews, welcome to the show. I feel like I've known you for a very, very long time. Um, I know that we were trying to pin down some of those dates before and we were both wrong, but that's okay. Um, And now from everything that people have heard from the intro, I know everybody's gonna be so excited to meet you and hear from you. And before we get started, we're gonna hear a lot about your accomplishments, your accolades in the field, but I want to start out this episode with congratulating you on your very latest award, the Bacon Award, given by the Coalition of Radical Life Extension for Extraordinary Contributions to the Advancement of Radical Life Extension. So congratulations, my friend. That is quite an honor. I I wish the name was different since I'm a (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, it it came from uh, two scientists in the past whose last name was Bacon. Francis Bacon and Roger Bacon, who pioneered this uh, modern science and the, the techniques of modern science. Yeah. So it's not named from, you know, no, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But no, that is, that is an awesome achievement and you have been at this for a long time. Um, Hold on. <laughs> where, where, what, how did you get started in this whole thing? I think I've heard you say that you've been interested in aging since 10 yeah, I mean, that's a long answer. I, I can, <laughs> you can cut me off anytime you want, but I okay. tell you, it was my, you know, coming home from school when I was like 10 years old with a note pinned to my shirt. My parents read the note and it said, Your son is very interested in science and medicine and astronomy. Uh, you should nurture that. Um, well, first thing my parents did was bought me a really nice telescope. And I was out on the front lawn one night when I was 10 years old looking at Saturn and Jupiter and things oh, like that. Fun. And my father just walks out and says uh, to the front line, says to me, you know, Bill, when you grow up, you should become a doctor and find a cure for aging. And it, he also said, I don't know why nobody's done that yet. He, he actually thought it should be something simple. He, he actually thought of aging as a disease. He thought it was something that he cured. Uh, wow. So I've thought that way ever since. It's only in the last like 10 years I've been hearing people tell me it's not a disease. It's you can't cure it. It doesn't make sense. But yeah. I, I'm I'm still a believer in that when we do cure it, and everybody else will say it is a disease. But but I was just very interested in studying aging. So so I, I got very excited about it because one, I love living. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't want to age. Even though I was only 10 years old at the time, I I'd seen my grandparents age. I remember my grandfather sitting in his house one time talking to my father and he says you know i'm not going to be around much longer my father goes no don't say that don't say that and sure enough he was gone within a year and it was like that's not right that's not just not right and uh 
So I, 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 I kind of like, you know, I started studying, well, let's say mostly when I got into high school, I started uh, anti-aging clubs, okay, things like that. And we'd sit around, me and my friends, and we would just talk about the theories on why we age. And I, I kept thinking, none of them make sense. I always say that all the twos and twos have to add up. Right. Everybody was saying that aging is caused by an accumulation of environmental damage, things like that. And if that was true, it, we'd have a much bigger bell curve, a broader bell curve in terms of the age we are when we die. Right. And uh, if that's not the case. The bell curve is very narrow. Yeah. Uh, and so, so it kind of tells me that aging is programmed. And so we, that's what the focus of all my talks used to be with this, these clubs. I had one in college too, just a group of friends. One of them, one of my friends actually got the Nobel Prize in medicine in 2010, I think it was, or 2000, oh, wow. here, some, somewhere around there, a guy named Bruce Boiler. But he, he and I were so fascinated with the subject of aging. We actually did research as undergraduates at UC San Diego uh, in a lab uh, run by a Dr. Dan Lindsley, where we actually were working on fruit fly aging. Um, we were we were novices relative to people like Dr. Mike Rose, who just blew us away when I learned about him and all his work he'd done on fruit flies and aging. But still, it was like we were we were beginners and we were just at the time. So that was the mid early to mid 1970s, and you know we we're just getting into it. And I had a lot to learn yet. But one thing that really bothered me was this narrow bell curve. Why, why do we have a narrow bell curve on the age of when people die? And why is why do dogs and cats also have a narrow bell curve? And the bell curve is very different in a very different position than ours. Yeah. And why do all these age-related diseases seem to correspond exactly with the same thing with aging? It, it, it always coming down to me, there's something programmed inside of ourselves that, that causes us to age. And, um, you know, I was a long time after that, that I started figuring out why that is, but I, I'll come back to that later. But yeah. the, uh, um, uh, I kept thinking, okay, what kind of biological mechanism could exist in a cell that would cause us to age? And it just didn't seem possible that evolution could evolve some type of clock that's yeah. ticking or something control mechanism stuff. But, you know, <laughs> One day I was playing pool in Palm Springs and, you know, I knocked a ball under the hole and I took my cue stick and up on the wall, there was this scorekeeper. It was, I moved a wooden chip from one side to the other. I thought, hey, I just kept, I just marked a score there. I wonder if there's some kind of mechanism that could exist there inside of ourselves, like keeping a score of cues up when playing pool. But then I started realizing, you know, you don't need to know, cell doesn't need to know how old it is. It needs to know how much longer it will live. Yeah, okay? I feel like that. It's a different subject. And so I, I then started thinking, okay, it's got to be something more like ride tickets at an amusement park. Uh, and, you know, you, your mother gives you a bunch of tickets. You go into the amusement park and you say, well, I, got, I get to ride 10 rides. Well, you ride two of them. Then you look at your ticket. Well, I can only have eight more rides. And on and on until you get to no tickets and the rides are over. Um, and so I thought, God, is there some kind of mechanism like that that evolution could have created in humans to, to uh, uh, for, cause us to age and also to put a limit on our lifespan? Well, so skip a few years. Nothing, nothing ever made sense to me. I couldn't figure it out. But then one day, in the early 1990s, I attended an anti-aging conference in Lake Tahoe uh, and heard a guy named Calvin Harley. It, it, well, before I say this, it was really funny because I mentioned Mike Rose before and his work with fruit flies. And, and uh, he and I actually started a company mm -hmm. that, at, at that conference to, to focus on doing his same techniques on fruit flies and do it in mice. Uh, we called it MRX uh, for Methuselah Research. Okay. And, uh, um, but the very next day, I heard a guy named Dr. Calvin Harley talk about telomere short. And I thought, oh, my God, it's those are the ride tickets. 
Uh huh. And so I instantly went up to the podium and told Calvin, you know, hey, well, I asked him first, did anybody, has anybody figured out how to add more tickets back? Yeah. You know, to make, make it younger. And he said, oh, we've been working for years on that. We've got collaborators all over the world working with us. Nobody's been able to figure it out. And I just said, let me come and work with you. I'll figure it out in, in three months. <laughs> And, you know, I, I, I don't love that. I'm notorious for doing that. I, I'm, I played key roles in the discovery of human growth hormone and tissue plasminogen activator and beta seron and uh -huh. and all, lots of biotech breakthroughs. And I, in all cases, I did these things after hundreds of other scientists couldn't do it, failed. And I just came in and did it single handedly. So I, I kind of had a background and it was a reputation in the biotech field as being the go to person if, if something can't. Nobody else could get something done. Right. So, so Calvin just offered me the job on the spot. Uh, and the worst part was I had to go now to Mike Rose and, and tell him that <laughs> I'm not going to be part of the new company we just started. And, uh, but I did, the thing that I didn't mention is that my father, who had inspired me to, be, to get into the Asian to begin with at 10 years old, he was at that conference too, because he was, TV movie producer. Okay. He, he wanted to make a, a documentary on the research that's going on to cure aging. Mm -hmm. And so I went to my father first and I said, Oh my God, I, I'm so worried. I, I've just agreed to start this company with Mike Rose and <laughs> some other scientists. And now I got to go tell him I don't want to do it. And I just said to my father, he, Would you like to be president of this new company that Mike Rose is doing? <laughs> and he said, Sure. So I, I, went, I went to Mike Rose and the other scientist that was involved. His name was Parvi Sabor. And uh, I was kind of disappointed because when I suggested to them that I'm, I'm going to go and my father can be the president, they, they went, yay. <laughs> because my father was already a successful businessman. He had started companies, uh, things like that. And they were really thrilled that my father was going to be the president of the company. Uh, and I kind of, my feelings were hurt a little bit. I, I, I went to, I went to Geron, uh, corporation to work with Calvin Harley and ended up discovering telomerase in three months and 17 days. So I was a oh little my bit, gosh. So I, I discovered, cause that was how to lengthen the telomeres. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. I, well, telomerase had already been discovered in a pond scum organism called tetrahymena. But what, what I discovered was a similar enzyme in humans. And okay. that's what we needed because the, the one in tetrahymena did not actually control aging, whereas the one in humans does. Right. It was very different from the one in the okay. But Okay. So, well, before we progress any yeah. further, let's take one step to the yeah. side. And for our listeners' benefit, because there is so much crosstalk, like kind of like what you said in the beginning, um, all this crosstalk of aging. What is aging? And Nothing's wrong with aging. It's a natural process. And other people are like, oh, no, it is a disease. So for the sake of our podcast, and really for the sake of all the podcasts I do, you guys, because you guys know me, we are talking biological, metabolical aging, which many of us do believe is a disease. Yeah. Well, I before I answer this, I, I have to say that I have my background and credentials are different than other people in the field. And so my answers to those questions are going to be very different from what you've heard before. Okay. But my credentials are about as good as can be because, you know, I, my, my PhD is essentially in the, what I call the, what and the how, the how and why of evolution, not the what and when. Right. Which is what most people study, but the how and why. Right. And that's called population genetics. But my PhD was also in molecular genetics, which is how to control our own evolution. Um, and through all that, I, I got a very strong background in statistical theory. And that's why when I can look at bell curves and stuff like that, I can say, this is not something that's caused by random damage or random events. It's caused by something that's programmed. Okay, so 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 in answer to my questions, I, I would say with starting off with what is aging mm -hmm. uh, i would say aging is really just a decline in function of body parts okay organs and things like that and 
after a certain age, our bodies lose the ability to support the maintenance of these body parts. Okay. Um, and I, and there's a reason for that. And that's because, um, from an evolutionary perspective, and this is where my population genetics comes in. Um, we're, the, the way evolution works is not really, when you hear about survival of the fittest, it's not the individual that is important, it's the species. Okay. Survival of the fittest species. And <clears throat> so survival depends on being able to survive a rapidly changing environment, which has happened a lot. And so most of the discussion, we're talking about ancient humans, not present humans, but uh, ancient humans. But we, we had to, uh, and, and other species too, they had to be able to survive rapidly changing environments. And the way to do that was to have a lot of variability, at least genetic variability within the species. Mm -hmm. So if you have a lot of variability, you increase the chances that some members of the species will survive the rapidly changing environment. If everybody's identical, they're all going to die or they're all going to live. Right. You need to have, you need to have a, variety so that some will live and some won't etc but uh the uh it turns out that if you if you do like uh pedigree charts of like like generation one generation two parents offspring grandchildren things like that you find out that the variability within the species actually increases a lot if you eliminate the forebearers okay so the, so the the generations that have already reproduced, okay, mm -hmm. it's it's if they just keep reproducing over and over again, if the like parents are just rebreeding over and over again and not letting the offspring interbreed, uh, then variability drops a lot within the species. And so, so the most successful species have all found ways to eliminate the longer living species, the ones that have lived long enough to raise their young right so there's no evolutionary advantage to living longer than it takes to raise your young you're actually in the way afterwards because you end up being competing with the younger generation that can that interbreeding will add even more variability in species so we so successful species have been the ones that have evolved a way to limit the lifespan and ancient humans you know we had children when we were 13 yeah and people could fend for themselves, ancient humans could fend for themselves by the time they were seven. So <clears throat> there was no evolutionary advantage to living longer than 20, because that's 13 plus seven is 20. And after that, you've already done your job to contribute to the variability, so contributing to this variability within the species. Now just get lost. Okay, so 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 we've evolved an aging process for that. And, and so that's why, after you're 20, there's no reason why we would evolve a system to actually protect us to live longer. So that's why we get cancer and heart disease and everything like that later ages, but not very rare. To, rarely do we get them at younger ages. Right. Um, so 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 that's why we age. So successful species are the ones that eliminate the old and. Uh, uh, we we do that by aging. It, it puts a limit on, on our lifespan. Uh, and you know, so so what else did I say? So, um, yeah, I guess that pretty much adds it up. So I, I mentioned that what is aging is a decline in in uh, maintenance, supporting the maintenance of our body parts, uh, because there's no reason to evolve ways to maintain it after we've raised our young. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, you know. Uh, the why we age and stuff like that. So the variability within species. Uh, and yeah, so how we age is, is definitely programmed. Um, so, so, so do you fight with yourself? Do you have this inner struggle where it's like, okay, well, I know that there's really no point for us to continue on because we've already done our job and we're in the way, but yet I want to fight or not fight, but I want to cure aging at the same time. So is there that inner conversation going on with you saying, Bill, you know, this isn't right. And you're like, oh no, but it is right. But this is what we need to do. Wait, humans are the only species that have actually become smart enough to control our own evolution. 
we control not our just our own evolution, but also animals like horses and dogs. Dogs yeah. came from wolves. Okay, nature didn't create dogs. Humans created dogs. Okay, yeah. and yeah. a lot of horse species and things like that. Uh, the uh, uh, and, and so I I don't have any conflict at all. I I think okay, evolution. You've done your part. Now get, get lost. <laughs> Uh, and that's 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 the other part of my PhD is molecular genetics. Yeah, because that is how we are going to control our own evolution. Okay, is through engineering our bodies. Uh, that's why I'm a very strong member of the transhumanist party, uh, which is all about trying to make us more better and things like that by by mechanical means and also by uh, genetic means. Gotcha. Okay, interesting. So. We have so much to dig into, and oh my gosh, um, where do we even start? Let's let's kind of kind of walk through this a little bit. Um, so, from your research, as you are like going through the stages, through the years, looking for that cure of aging, um, what are some of the things that you see as the main contributors to aging besides evolution? Um, things that we are doing to ourselves. Well, I always say that it, there's a lot of things that cause aging. Okay? Uh -huh. uh, and they're like multiple sticks of dynamite that are burning inside of ourselves. And the big question is, which stick of dynamite has its shortest fuse? And that's the one we need to focus on. Okay. Now, in in all my studies, I've learned that the stick of dynamite with the shortest fuse is a different stick of dynamite in humans than it is in mice and other rodents. Okay, so so even though we all age by several different mechanisms, telomere shortening appears to be the shortest stick, the stick of dynamite with the shortest fuse in humans, if you have the perfect genetics and lead the perfect lifestyle. Okay, but then you know, not everybody dies from old age because of short telomeres. But at least the some of the other things are controllable. Like mice, their stick of dynamites with the shortest fuse appear to be both oxidative stress and mitochondria dysfunction. Now we also suffer from oxidative stress and mitochondria dysfunction too. Yeah. But, but if you if you lead a healthy lifestyle and take the right supplements, you can control that pretty easily. And if you have the really good genetics too, because a lot of people there's it's just hopeless because their genetics are bad. Yeah. And that's that's where hopefully uh, gene editing and stuff like that is going to save the world in the future. Um, so, so yeah, the multiple sticks of dying. I, I believe that a lot of things cause us to age, but the one that really we, we humans, and, and when I say humans, there's other animals that I, that, well, colleagues of mine have figured out also age by telomere shortening is having the shortest, the shortest, the dynamite with the shortest fuse is, Telomere shortening is in humans and most other primates, not all of them, like uh, marmosets, they do have it, but le uh, lemurs don't. Lemurs age more like mice. Okay. Um, then there's also dogs, cats, horses, sheep, pig, and deer. They also all age by telomere shortening. Okay. And what is really surprising, what well, it's not, not that surprising to me, but the most is that half the animals I just listed are domesticated animals. Yeah. Okay, dogs, cats, and horses, um, which is telling me that aging is a relatively recent evolutionary event. Okay, um, and you know maybe a hundred thousand years ago we really didn't age, and there was no need to age because predators and things like that killed us off faster than aging could have ever done. And so uh, it might be that aging in a lot of animals didn't really evolve until the last few thousand years. Yeah. Um, I don't really know, but I wish there, there's studies I'd like to do. Like, for instance, I'd like to look more closely at what causes aging in wolves. Okay. Since dogs came from wolves yeah. and it would be really incredible if we were to find out that wolves don't age by telomere shortening, but dogs do. It would, it would really be suggesting that, that aging is a relatively recent event. I don't know when humans started creating dogs, but it was long, 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 long time ago. Yeah, um, yeah. definitely. So, yeah. Okay, so now we're, we're talking all this stuff about telomeres. What is a telomere? 
Okay. Well, telomeres are things found at the very tips of our chromosomes. Mm -hmm. And every time a cell divides, the telomeres get a little bit shorter. And it's not by wear and tear and degradation and unraveling. And, uh, it, it's, there's a lot of theories about, they, they, you often hear when people talk about telomere shortening, they, they talk about the degradation or, or telomere dysfunction. Things like that, but it's it's actually it's actually not the case. There is, I mean, there is ways to get to cause degradation in cell telomeres. I call that accelerated aging or accelerated telomere shortening. But the main cause of telomere shortening is actually not shortening at all. It's when a cell divides and the DNA is duplicated. When the cell, when every time, so on, you have a cell and it wants to divide to make two daughter cells. Everything inside that parent cell needs to be duplicated. That includes the chromosomes mm -hmm. and telomeres, mm -hmm. and so when when the cell divides and it makes a new copy of the DNA, it lacks the ability to duplicate all the way to the end of the chromosome. So the new DNA is made shorter. It wasn't okay. rated to become shorter; it was made shorter. So mm -hmm. so the cell divides. Uh, the daughter cells have shorter telomeres than the parent did. And eventually, so every time a cell divides, it gets like 50 to 100 bases shorter. Bases are measurement of DNA length. Uh, and so it turns out, and Leonard Hayflick discovered this in 1961, human cells can only divide a certain number of times. At least that's when he published it, it was 1961. He probably discovered it before. Um, so, so telomeres explain why cells, human cells can only divide a certain number of times because every time the cell divides, it gets a little bit shorter. Right. And when you do the math, you find out that well, you, you're, you're, when you're first conceived, your telomeres are 15,000 bases in length. Okay. When you're born, because there's so much cell division from a single cell embryo to a newborn baby, by the time you're born, your telomeres have shortened down to 10,000 bases. And then Things don't stop there because right. you have a lot of growing to do, a lot of diseases to fight, wounds to heal, things like that, immune functions to fight. Uh, your telomeres are constantly shortening throughout your life. Some, some, some tissues like skin and immune system and gut, they, they are dividing all the time. So it's like it's, it's constant division. They're called continuous replicators. Okay. Um, so the telomeres are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And it turns out that when cells get, when the telomeres get down to 5,000 bases, your cells lose the ability to function and they enter into a stage called senescence. And then later the cells die. Right. Um, and so um, uh, that's, you know, it, it's, that's something that really, we, well, Leonard Hayflick had figured that out, but, but it wasn't understood why this happens until we discovered telomerase and, and showed that telomeres uh, we could we could overcome what was called the Hayflick limit on the number of size, times a cell can divide. We totally obliterated the Hayflick limit by lengthening telomeres in human cells with telomeres. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, that's, um, yeah, that's that's really interesting. Now, when when I first heard you speak, I heard you talk about you know you kind of did the example of the clock. Is that still a good example of kind of what's going on is, you know, the clock yeah. is ticking and telomerase kind of backs it back up a little bit or? Telomere shortening is a ticking clock that we have inside of our cells. Yeah. And it is actually limiting our lifespan. I mean, there's other things going on, as I said before, is the control aging, but yeah. nothing is ever going to work to prevent our aging or slow down our aging. Yeah unless we also figure out a way to stop this telomere clock ticking. Okay. Because um, it's, it's, there's, when the telomeres get down to 5,000 bases, we're dead. Okay. And uh, there's, there's no, you know, so what if you come up with anti-senolytics or senolytics or antioxidants or anti-inflammatories and things like that? It's not going to do you any good if your telomeres are still getting down to 5,000 bases. So, right. so that's a key thing that we have to solve. And then after we solve that, you know, maybe, so right now, when we do the math on the telomeres, it's impossible for a human to live beyond 125 years. Okay. And that's only if you have perfect genetics and perfect lifestyle 
can you even come close to 125 years? Which is why we don't usually hear of somebody living to 125. Yeah. And well, there's people now, there's at least two people that live to be 120. One lived to be 122. But now there's a lot of reports that um, studies are indicating that her daughter actually took her place. And she, the original person whose name I'm not going to mention because everybody will argue with me on it. It, it. The original person actually died and there was some kind of like money that was coming in from an ex-marriage or something like that, you know, and they didn't want to lose that money. So the daughter impersonated the mother and she then died at supposedly 122 when she was probably only like 70 or something. Oh my gosh. No, so, so, but, and I don't know about the other person, but yeah, but it's like even that she, she smoked every day, things like that. So she didn't have the perfect lifestyle, Yeah. but uh, I think nobody has the perfect lifestyle. Nobody has the perfect genetics. And so that's why nobody's really come close to 125 limits, but uh, I believe we can get there. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, solving the telomere shortening problem is, is the way to do that. And then, but you have to do everything else. You just can't, you have to lead a good life lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's tell you, you mentioned accelerated aging and I've got a lot of people, you know, that listen to this that are very interested in, in that aspect of it. So accelerated aging are things that while it might influence a lot of other metabolic issues in our body, it can speed up the shortening. Am I correct? It can speed yes. up the shortening of the telomere. What are some of those things? Well, free radicals, anything radiation, free radicals, all those kind of things can actually damage telomeres and cause them to degrade, okay, to get okay. shorter, faster than they should. Okay. But inflammation is also another thing that can cause telomere shortening because inflammation does it by causing the cells to divide more often than they normally would. Oh, wow. So as a result, that, that's probably one of the main things we, we got to worry about is doing things that cause our cells to divide faster than they were originally meant to. Um, so let, let, let me pick a few examples, like drinking alcohol. Okay. Mm -hmm. You drink alcohol, the alcohol kills your liver cells, but that's okay at, at first because other cells in your liver divide to replace those dead cells. But when they divide to replace those dead cells, the telomeres get shorter. Okay. And because you're killing off these cells, now the cell division to replace dead cells is going faster. Therefore, telomere shortening is going faster. When the telomeres get short, too short, like down to close to 5,000 bases, it can't divide anymore to replace those dead cells. And so you get liver cirrhosis. You get all these streaky things that, that look like accumulation of dead cells because nothing's kicking those dead cells out of the way. And so but that's a really good example. So you get liver cirrhosis. And, and if we could keep the telomeres from shortening, you could continue to drink forever and not have to worry about getting liver cirrhosis. I like that example because it's the simplest one that a lot of people understand. And, and yeah. since a lot of people like to drink it. it, 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 it. <laughs> and another example is, is microdermabrasion. Anything you do to your skin to uh, like, like acid treatments or laser treatments. Yeah actually kill cells in your skin that, that induces other cells to divide to replace those cells yeah and that always makes you look younger okay but uh it's actually you're getting older okay? that's, and, uh, yeah that's always been one of my my thoughts because i'm uh you know as a holistic practitioner one of my my big things especially you know a woman in her 50s all of my friends my markets my clients um, you know, skin aging is a major component. And when I look at the things with skin aging, I'm just like, well, if I can get somebody to start taking really good care of their skin, their whole body is going to be taken care of. So, but that was always one of my thoughts is if we're doing, like you said, microdermabrasion or heavy retinol treatments or chemical peels, and we're causing the, the quickening of the cellular turnover, are we going to end up with accelerated aging earlier? Yeah, exactly. That's a lot of times when you see old movie actresses and they look like prune faces. Yeah. It's, it's why. Okay. Yeah. It's because they accelerated the aging in their skin from all the treatments they've done to, to stay looking young. Oh, okay. no. Is there, in, 
Okay, so I've got to stop well, right I'm, there. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> telomeres are cured. Okay. Okay, girls, we need to like, we need to start funding this this research. That's... The same thing is true for immune boosters. Anything that boosts boosts the immune system is going to cause rapid cell division. Any growth hormones like human growth hormone, which you know I'm one of the inventors of, uh, those are going to accelerate uh, telomere shortening. So uh, it's and I. I you know, I always say, what's the point of living a long time if you're not living? Yeah. So I encourage people to continue to do the microdermabrasion and human growth hormones and immune boosters and drink alcohol, you know, if it's, if it's your thing. And because uh, I'm going to come through with this. I'm determined to get out of the telomeres and, and I'll come in and save the day <laughs> uh, for all those people that really just wanted to enjoy living. There you go. You just need to, we need to get you that Superman cape and instead of an S, we'll put a T on it. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about telomerase and what your company, Sierra Sciences, what you're doing, what kind of research you're doing right now to make these discoveries. Well, the main thing that I want to do is I want to discover a, an invent, a design, a pill, a small molecule drug that can go in a pill that you can swallow. And it gets into your bloodstream and gets to all the cells of your body, induces the production of telomerase. And then the enzyme that, you know, I led the research and discovered at Geron Corporation in the early 1990s. Um, it, it lengthens your telomeres and if everything behaves exactly like human cells do in vitro and in a lot of studies with mice, we should see all of our tissues get young in every way imaginable. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think we're, you know, when we do that, we lengthen our telomeres, we'll, we'll see our DNA methylation patterns also change. We'll see our glycos IgG glycosylation and glycosylation of other proteins change. To, to become a younger characteristic. So I, I do believe there's a lot of markers of aging, but I think telomeres actually very likely control them all. Yeah. And so I like the telomeres, but so, so I don't really, I think the best measure of aging is what I call, what I used to call the Betty White test. You know, I want to see, I, I wanted to see Betty White go from 95 to 25, walk out on stage and it look, feel, behave 25 again. Okay. That's, that's a, as far as I'm concerned, showing that your telomeres got longer, your DNA methylation patterns changed, or your IgG glycosylation changed, doesn't mean you reversed aging unless you also passed what I call the Betty White test. Yeah. I'm now calling it the William Shatner test because <laughs> William Shatner is, is up there in age too. And yeah. he's a young guy, but the problem with William Shatner is that he, he already looks. 20 years younger, 30 years younger than he is. So, so it's like, but it's still, it's still somebody who people know. And boy, the yeah. most amazing thing in the world was him going up in the uh, spacecraft. Up in Isn't that cool? And so, that's, yeah. yeah, that's craziness. Yeah, no, so I was like in reading, reading a lot of your business plan. You have a lot of different ideas of how this can be, you know, how it can be used from skincare products to, I love the longevity sprinkle um, and cancer treatments and detection, anti-aging therapies, um, health diagnostics. There's a lot of avenues that can be tapped into. My, my main mission is to cure aging, okay? Yeah. I want to be around when we discover life on other planets, okay? That kind of thing. Right. I love living. You know, I don't want living to be any less lovable because of aging. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, uh, so, but it turns out there's a lot of other things we can do that are, that kind of don't reach that, that threshold. Uh, and these are things that, you know, are, could be very uh, profitable, marketable products. Yeah. Um, imagine, I mean, we, we already have we've discovered small molecule chemicals and natural products that do induce production of telomerase in our cells, but not enough to actually reverse aging. Okay. 
So our, you know, but but they're still useful because they they theoretically should slow down age. Yeah. Okay. And, and so That's a good start. It's a good yeah, start no, until you know you figure like, figure it all out. We want to kind of slow it down so you have a extended time yeah. to figure this out. I personally don't want to spend my time focusing on those yeah. because I want to get that cure for aging because I want to, I want to be one of the people that benefits from all the research, but right. I am making all these other discoveries and ideas available to marketing partners. I already have a lot of people selling products, including skin products, like you, you mentioned that that contain telomerous inducers that would actually help uh, slow down the aging of skin. Uh, and actually, there's a lot of age reversal that's seen, too, because it turns out the really critically short telomeres need a lot less telomerase to relengthen them than the longer telomeres. And there's a whole story on that. If anybody ever wanted to more learn more about all these things I'm saying, they can always go to my website. And there's a video, a two-hour video called Everything About Telomeres. Uh, and... Uh, you don't have to listen to the whole video because it begins with a table of contents. It tells you where to go. And so you can, you can listen to five minutes here, five minutes there, yeah. but it's, um, but the, the skin products do actually have, do there's, there's been studies done, uh, uh, clinical studies actually looking at skin depthness wrinkles and things like that. It's shown that they actually do provide some age reversal, even though, they don't produce enough telomerase to totally reverse aging. And this is because the shortest telomeres preferentially get longer with telomerase than the long telomeres. Yeah. But to reverse sense. aging, we have to increase the long telomeres too. Yeah. The, uh, so, so these products are available. People can Google them. I'm not going to mention product names here because somebody will get offended if I forget to name them. Uh, right. But there's a lot of companies out there right now that are selling things uh, that we discovered here, uh, not just for skin, but supplements too. Yeah. Uh, and so we, so my research is funded by the royalties that we get from those companies, yeah. but I have nothing to do with running those companies because I'm not a marketer. I'm a scientist. Yeah. I want to work at the lab bench and cure aging, but, but there's opportunities here. And now, so imagine a salt shaker that you sprinkle on your food or your dog's food that contains one of these chemicals. Okay. That's the longevity sprinkle that you just mentioned. Yeah. I mean, how easy is that? Line. It's yeah. a gold line yeah. if somebody decided to take it on and market it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know why it's so difficult to get somebody to do that, but uh, I'm not going to do it because I don't, I, I'm too busy with the research. You're, um, the, you're the science guy. Yeah. I, I exactly. I'm the science guy, but it turns out you have to have a science guy also doing the marketing. So I, I've agreed with all the companies that are selling things right now that I will oftentimes speak to explain the science to audiences. Yeah. Stuff like that. But I'm not going to get around and try to market it. Okay. Yeah. But, yeah. Now, I okay, so I, I do have a question. Um, and we've talked a little bit about this, you know, in the past, just and I, I know that you've even addressed this some on some of your videos on your website. There is so much noise out there and every product in the world, every product on the shelf says they have the cure for aging. So are there any tips that you can give our listener? Because not everybody has access to you to say, hey, Bill, is this true? You know, is there any tips of what to look for in ABC company or the, not even the company, but in the pathways that they say they're using. Can we Google, like, should we be Googling like PubMed or should we be looking at YouTube videos made by podcasters like me? Should, how, do we, how do we find out the facts of what's real? Well, okay, so <clears throat> there are some videos where I actually address that. Okay. One's One's called How to Know What's Real and Not Real. Yeah. It was a presentation I gave at an organization called People Unlimited, which is the most enthusiastic group in the world in terms of figuring out a way to extend lifespan. Um, but uh, uh, th there's a few other videos where I address that too. 
but it, it's actually not easy because I, I, like I can do it. Okay. I, I can, but it, it's, you really have to, you have to have the ability to be good at statistical theory, logic, data analysis, things like that, to be able to read a study and know if it's legitimate or not. Yeah. And sometimes it's an unintentionally not legitimate because the scientist didn't really have strong knowledge and background and backgrounds and statistics and data analysis and experimental design, but they still get their papers published. Yeah. So even in PubMed, you can always find support for anything you wish to be true. Okay. If you want to, if you want to find a study that says smoking isn't bad for you, I guarantee you, you can find it in PubMed, even though PubMed is pure, only peer reviewed studies. Yeah. Okay. A lot of papers slip through and a lot of the companies that try to sell part products that really they know don't work. Okay. will try to get a peer reviewed publication yeah. one way or another, and they succeed. Uh, and then they, they cite that paper as proof that they actually got it. But I mean, so, so, but I always say you have to do what's called okay, meta analysis is where you read a bunch of papers. And even you'll find some say one thing and one say, some say the opposite thing. So you kind of count how many say one thing one versus the other and go with the one that says the most. That's okay. my way. But that's, actually, <laughs> that's a lot of work, but it's um, to do it right. You have to do what's called critical meta-analysis, yeah. peer-reviewed studies and non-peer-reviewed studies to actually look at the data. Look, did they design their experiments right? Did they analyze their data? Did they do the statistics right? Are they making any false assumptions? Do they know even how to do the techniques? Okay, the research protocols. Now, I'm good at all that kind of stuff. So I can read a paper and I can write whole paragraphs on all the things that they've done wrong. But it's it's almost impossible to really know what's real and not real unless you really can get into that and, and find somebody who's good at these kind of things like I am. But it, it's, it, there's, okay, so the thing is, a lot of a lot of the big products that are on the market are because the scientists are good marketers. But see, scientists, good scientists do not make good marketers. And good marketers do not make good scientists. Okay. The, the scientists that make good marketers are end up usually being pretend scientists. Yeah. And that's the ones you hear about all the time, all over the web, all you know, webinars, things like that, people promoting these products with scientific proof saying it, those are usually pretend scientists, okay? Yeah. People that, the only time they ever put a lab coat on is when the camera's on them. <laughs> now, I, my lab's right behind me. I've got 10,000 square feet of lab space here. Uh, I'm, that's what I want to do. I want to be in the lab coat. They're with my lab coat. I don't have my lab coat on now, which a lot of people would do yeah. if they were being interviewed. But I put my lab coat on a second I go in the lab. Yeah. Um, and this is, this is the kind of stuff that got me so successful in all the things I've done before, including the discovery of telomerase and, as I said, human growth hormone, erythropoietin. Uh, I can't even remember them all. Uh, uh, tissue plasminogen activator. Uh, the discoveries I've made because I focus on just the science. I don't focus on what can I get published or what right. can I, how much money can I make if I put this together. It's, it's. Uh, I'm just. I just want the world to be happier and healthier. Really. Yeah, um, you. I love this quote that I found in your bio. And um, it is, my passion is to cure aging. My passion isn't to make sure that everyone knows that I'm the one who did it. Yeah. That's humbling. That, that's, you know, that's, that's really your heart. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted you on the show, because it's, it's, you help to clear up a little bit of that confusion that is out there. You know, um, a lot of us, are very anxious to, for you to figure this whole telomerase thing out. Um, I would, can you can you give us an inside look, maybe, to what your regimen is for things that we can do to help our health span as you're figuring out the longevity aspect of it? Yeah, I think I think that's a real important discussion. I just want to make one comment first. As yeah, a big bottleneck to the research to cure aging is actually not the science. It's the funding to do the okay. science. And as I was mentioning, these pretend scientists or the scientists that do all the marketing, they're the ones that get 
most of the funding. And I feel, I feel terrible for the investors that invested in them yeah. because they've actually thrown their money away. They're throw, they're, they, maybe they'll make a profit, but they, if they were passionate about curing aging, if that was their main passion, they, they, they invested in the wrong people. And that's, that is, I see that time and time again. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just, that, that's, that's the big obstacle. We gotta, we gotta get investors to start investing in the right people. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not the only one. I, there's a list of people that I could give that I think really are genuinely interested in contributing to finding the cure for aging that really aren't into, uh, how much money can they make doing it? Right. Um, yeah. So when I, when I cure aging, if I'm the one, uh, I want to be obscure. Okay. I, I, I don't want, I want to be off in my own place. I don't, I want people to always be bugging me with, oh, that's what you're the one that did it. I want to focus on after a cure aging, I want to focus on curing other things. Right. Okay? I was going to uh, ask you what, what's, what's after aging? Well, you know, we can still die from being run over by buses. Okay. Our trucks. Okay. And, uh, uh, there is actually Elon Musk and Randall Kone and others are working on something called whole brain emulation. Which is called also brain uploading. Okay, okay. yeah. What this is is that if you know you're suddenly in an accident, your airbag opens up, your brain is is by Wi-Fi is uploaded to a computer, okay, and uh, then uh, later your brain is downloaded to a clone that's made from some of your tissues that were recovered in the accident. Oh okay? my gosh! And so, so you're back to you being you. That, that's one of the things I think is best. The other thing is cryogenics. I I think that. That's the last resort, but it's like, I'm very optimistic about someday. It, the problem isn't freezing people. The problem is thawing them out. <laughs> and someday somebody's going to figure out how to thaw out a human yeah. and not have all the cells be destroyed from ice crystals forming and things like yeah. that. And that's yeah. what's going but, but, but those, those are the other things that I'd like to be uh, really active in. And then there's also all these genetic diseases, okay, that affect people that, that uh, have nothing to do with aging, but they still die at young ages because of they have some genetic variation. I don't want to call it abnormality because we don't know. Maybe they were the normal ones and we're all the abnormal ones. Yeah. But, but it's a ge genetic variations that cause diseases. And, and, you know, we hear a lot about gene editing. Uh, and I think that's the future. But, you know, gene editing is not new. I was doing gene editing back in the early 2000s, uh, back to late 1990s. Uh, <clears throat> just a new technique to, has come along called CRISPR to do it. Uh -huh. but, but the problem isn't how to edit genes. We've known how to edit genes forever and ever. The problem is how to deliver the machinery to edit the genes to all the cells of the body. Right. And that's, that's something that's always been an obstacle. Um, and uh, uh, Zinc Fingers, I think, was the very first gene editing method. And they're actually companies that are doing that are still working on trying to find ways to deliver the genes. And I want to get involved in that because everybody has genetic differences. You know, if people get their DNA sequence or they get their, what are called SNPs mm -hmm. of their DNA uh, from companies like 23andMe. And it tells you a lot about, nobody's perfect. Okay. Every one of us have, have uh, things that we wish we didn't have variations in our genes that we, they're called risk alleles. We we don't we want the non-risk alleles, not the risk alleles. Right. And uh, so, but gene editing, we can edit that. And that's one of the things that I really want to do. And it, you'll see that in my business plans. Okay. I'm I'm. Uh, it's uh, gene therapy is pretty much we got to improve gene therapy to the point of where we can deliver it to all of our cells in a way that doesn't cause harm to our cells, which is. One of the problems. So I, I want to get very involved in that after I cure aging. Yeah. Okay, right? You've got three, I mean, three months and 17 days. Might, might beat me to cure an aging, and I hope he does, because I want to benefit from it. There uh, you go. <laughs> yeah. so what were you saying? I just said you've got three months and 17 days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's step one, just discovering the enzyme, getting, getting it now produced in all of our cells. Yeah. That's taken me 20 years now. But yeah. I think we could have done it by now if we had had more funding. Right. Right. That is, that is the sticking point. That is absolutely the sticking point. And, you know, I hear, you know, friends, colleagues, um, other, other peers that 
funding is always the issue. You know, it's it's something that we we have to cure funding to cure aging and many of these other issues that we're facing. Um, and we're going to get into talking a little bit, just really briefly afterwards about how people can find out more about Sierra Sciences. But to backtrack really fast. Well, what, what do I take? What, what do, do you I do? do? What are yeah. you doing? Well, I believe that the number one cause of aging is inflammation. Okay. <clears throat> and at, at short telomeres cause inflammation and, and also inflammation cause telomeres to get shorter. So it's a, a two sorted kind uh -huh. of thing. Yeah. The, but, but solving the inflammation problem is probably one of the most important things that we can do. The inflammation causes cardiovascular disease, it causes Alzheimer's, it causes diabetes, it causes everything. Okay. <clears throat> all the things that shorten our lifespan can all almost all be attributed to inflammation. So I'm a vegan. Okay. okay. I'm a vegan because plants don't have as many uh, inflammatory components as uh, meats, you know, fish, fowl, and, and regular meat, and also dairy products. Okay. Uh, what's his name? Floyd. Uh, forgetting his name. There, there's a really good book called um, um, Inflammation Nation. Okay. Right. Uh -huh. it, it talks about arachidonic acid. Okay. Arachidonic acid is a omega three. There's omega three fatty acid. Maybe it, it might be an omega six. I can't remember. It's omega a fatty nine. acid that actually is very inflammatory. It's not found in plants, but it's found in everything else. Okay, yeah. all the meats and dairy products, even milk and cheese. So, I I avoid all that because I I want to limit my arachidonic acid. Uh, but I, I I do all kinds of other things to stay away from inflammatory components uh, and everybody's different. Some things cause inflammation and some people are not others. And so I take tests every year, like the ALCAT test, A-L-C-A-T or the MRT test, MRT. Okay. Uh, there's companies that sell these things that test your blood and then they test like hundreds and hundreds of different types of foods and they can identify which food induce inflammatory responses. Right. Okay. And then they send me the list and then I don't eat those foods. Okay. That's, that's, so I do that. So I, I, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm hardcore. <laughs> I want to be around when we have a cure for aging. I want to be around when we find life in outer space and right. things like that. Uh, I and like that. Uh, I, the, when we figure out the origin of the universe and things like that. Uh, and so I've got to be making certain I'm doing everything I can now, but so, so reducing inflammation is not, is very key. Okay, right. but also re reducing oxidative stress is also very key. Okay, because oxidative stress is also a major cause of aging. Mm -hmm. And how do and we so, do that? I, well, lots of antioxidants. Okay, okay. Uh, and <clears throat> I mean, my favorites are alpha lipoic acid, uh, N acetylcysteine. Um, well, N acetylcysteine got some bad press lately because N acetylcysteine forms glutathione when it gets inside your cells. Yeah. And that's making all the marketers of glutathione products having a hard time trying to sell their products when you can get for a fraction of the cost glutathione in your cells just by taking NFC assisting and right. with NAC. So mm -hmm. uh, there's companies trying to shut them down, trying to make false claims that it's hazardous to your health, but it's not true. But so NAC, so alpha lipoic acid, NAC, um, vitamin E, vitamin D, they're also anti inflammatories too. So, that, so you get a double advantage. Oh, yeah. Omega-3 fatty acids are anti-inflammatories, uh, at least some of them. And there's even some omega-6 fatty acids that are uh, anti-inflammatory. But getting back to the antioxidants, what else? Um, uh, e -G -E -C -G -C. I can't remember. The one in green tea. The green tea one. I always get those letters mixed up yeah. too. And I'm a nutritionist. And I, I get them mixed up. E -C -G -C. Yes. C yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, <laughs> vitamin E in yes. their analogs and things like that. Uh, vitamin C, all those things are, are really good. So I, I take them all, but yeah. you know, you don't want to take too much of an antioxidant because they become pro-oxidants. They actually, when you take too much, they actually increase your uh, uh, oxidative processes, so your ox oxidative stress. Oh, wow. You can overcome that by taking 
small amounts of a lot of different types of antioxidants. Right. About okay. Yeah. So there, there's, there's. I'm, I'm sure I'm leaving some off the list, but that's one of the things that that we're very interested in finding somebody to market because I, I have written down in places, you know, all my supplements, and I know which antioxidants you want to take and which ones together. I just don't have them memorized off the top of my head, but I would love to put together some type of package where it contains all those to give to people. Yeah. The anti-inflammatories and anti see, anti-inflammatories and antioxidants mostly. But one benefit of just decreasing oxidative stress and inflammation is also that decreases the rate of telomer shortening too. Okay, because both inflammation and oxidative stress, in addition to all the other bad things they do to you, cause accelerated telomer shortening. Right. So uh, what about uh, stress? Does stress cause stress telomer shortening? Good. So that's the other thing I do. I meditate. Okay. I meditate a lot. I do a lot of yoga. I was actually the keynote speaker at a meditation and yoga conference in San Diego a few years ago. Nice. Uh, but I, I'm very big in it. I meditate 10 times a day. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, like short uh, periods of time or do you block out like hours on end or how? Well, I, I don't, I don't make any rules or anything like that. I just say, okay, time to meditate. And I just meditate. Okay. And uh, that's, you know, got, as you know, I've talked about it before. I've got this beautiful cabin out in the middle of nowhere. And when I need mm -hmm. to meditate, here's that's the where I, that's one of the greatest places to go because there's no distractions. You know, people who meditate and always say how important it is they teach meditation. They will often say you can meditate at any time, but I'm the first one that's going to say it's impossible to meditate when somebody's hammering the wall <laughs> down next door to you or something like that. It's a dog is barking. <laughs> You gotta find a quiet place to really get successful meditation. Yeah. But uh, there's lots of data. And I showed this when I was that keynote speaker at that conference. Lots of data now showing that there's a lot of benefits to meditation, including people who meditate a lot have longer telomeres than people who don't. Okay. <laughs> so so it's so, so reducing stress, you know, Dr. Elisa Eppel, okay, E P E L. She is probably the top person I know. I could I consider her a good friend because I'm so in awe of her. But she's she's published books and stuff like that on on how to reduce stress and, and other psychological problems and stuff like that 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 affect aging. And uh, uh, I'm going blank on the name of her main book that she published with the Nobel Prize winner Elizabeth Blackburn. Uh, but uh, we'll look it up. Yeah. Okay. What do you think? The, well, I can't remember the name of it. That's embarrassing. Okay, so but it, it's a really, really great book. Okay, um, but so so meditation, um, exercise. Okay, now here's this is a, another double-edged sword. Okay, things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, if you don't exercise consistently, if you're one of these people that run every two weeks, and you know every six months run a marathon and do really well, but you're on your hands and knees throwing up and you can't, you can't run again for days because you're so beaten up. Yeah. Um, you're actually increasing your inflammation and oxidative stress. Uh, and so that's not good for you. Okay. Yeah. But if you exercise all the time, you, you can find that your inflammatory markers, which, you know, TNF alpha, uh, CRP, all these things don't increase. You actually do not increase inflammation. You actually decrease inflammation by exercising all the time. Yeah. Um, and and the other thing is you got to keep it fun. Okay. Go enter a 10K race, but don't kill yourself doing it. Right. Have fun doing it. When it quits being fun, quits. Okay. Yeah. That's what I always say. There's nothing wrong with dropping out of a race because the race stopped being fun. But, yeah. you know, so that's, I, I, I can talk for an hour. I've spoken at running groups and other exercise groups about the importance of fun exercise as opposed to the really rigorous exercise. I always say, you know, combine exercise with adventure. Okay. So oh, I, yeah. I say, I say, go out and get, you, you know, you got your mountains right in front of you. You've never been up there. You have no idea what's up there. Why get on an airplane or a boat and go? visit Hawaii 
when you can explore your own backyard and there's so much there, you'd be amazed. So, so I'm all the time just going off for long runs, uh, carrying food and water with me and uh, pumps that I, in case I run out of water, I can pump water from a stream and yeah. drink that. It, it, it's, but I, I just, I find that combining the adventure, you, you end up developing a disorder that I call can't turn around disorder. Okay. It's, <laughs> I swear to God, it's real. It is it's, real. I, I I've start, experienced that. I start running a trail, and this trail, I've never been on it before, but I'm dying to know what's around the next turn or uh -huh. over the next hill. And I say, I'm going to go for, I'm going to just go run for five miles. Uh -huh. but 10 miles later, I haven't even turned around yet because I keep wanting, I can't turn around. Uh -huh. Okay. And yeah. so like, that's a good disorder to have. We, okay? we experience that hiking. Yeah, all the time. <laughs> and uh, so, so. Yeah, so I encourage, but that's a good way. I, another thing is when I speak to running groups, and a lot of people in the audience are people that aren't runners. They're people who are trying to get into running. And I say, you know, go out there, and if you see a coyote, run after it. Follow it. Where does it go? Even if you're not on trail. Off trail running is the most exciting thing in the world. Yeah. As you know, I broke my arm about a few months ago from uh -huh. off trail running. You're always jumping over trees and things like that, dead falling trees. I had a bad crash and broke my arm, but you know, it's fixed now and I'm back to doing it again. Right. Um, but the, uh, it's like, there's, that's a great way to exercise. And that kind of exercise actually decreases your rate of telomere shortening, yeah. decreases your oxidative stress, decreases your inflammation. Uh, and it increases, and it's, 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 it's moving meditation is yeah. what it really is. It it's, really is. It's, it's you all your stress just totally disappears when you are out doing adventure, stuff like that. It is. Finding it people to go sense. with you, that's the hard part. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the one I, that's why I run alone a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Now, speaking of running too, really fast, you, you are an ultra marathon runner, which means you run a hundred miles? hundred mile races and longer. And anything longer than a marathon is considered an ultra marathon, but my favorite distance is a hundred miles. Um, and it's because it's a vacation, you know, it's like, <laughs> I can't wait to start and I, I'll finish, I'll get close to, you know, being races and I'll, people ask me how you're doing. I'll say, I hope it never ends Oh my you know? God. because I'm not killing myself. Yeah. I mean, I finished hundred mile races, jumping all excited, full of energy, wanting to tell all the stories of things I've seen and done and things like that during the race. You know, you run all day and all night with a headlamp. You get very exciting experiences. I, I mean, some of them, I've, I've run into mountain lions in the middle of three o'clock in the morning. And, you know, my headlights shining on them and their eyeballs are reflecting back. And I, you know, I've always found they're just as scared of me as I am of them. And so I just move on. And as soon as I move on, they, 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 they calm down. Yeah. Uh, it's like, it's, it's, it's like, what's the point of living a long time if you're not living? Right. You know, it's, but now... It, so to the listeners, you know, you didn't start out, you didn't just wake up one morning after never exercising or anything, say, I'm going to run a hundred miles today. So you, you built up to that. Actually, you know, I've been uh, running my entire life. I, 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 I've been, I was on the track teams and cross country teams in high school and college. In graduate school, I started running marathons on my own because graduate schools didn't really allow you, sport, didn't give you sports activities. Um, but the, uh, but I, I always, you know, I was always into adventure and endurance. I became an endurance horseback rider. And then one time I was competing in a race, a hundred mile race on horseback. And I come across this runner. <laughs> I couldn't resist. And I had to stop. How, how could a runner be this far away from anywhere? And so it was a woman. I started talking to her and she said she was training for the Western States, 100 mile race which I had never heard of at the time. This is like in the uh, early 1990s. Okay. And uh, so all of a sudden I became obsessed with, I have to do 100 mile races. Well, I jumped so that very next year I signed up for my fifth, first 50 mile race. And I had so much fun. When I finished that race, I was just jumping with joy. I signed up for another 50 mile race the very next weekend. Because, because I run every day, I, I'm right now, approaching almost a thousand consecutive days of running two miles or more. Uh, and it's just, it's an addiction. And that's only because of the pandemic. 
because I'm not running as many races, so I don't have to taper. And the only reason I ever stop take a day off was to taper for a race. Yeah. So I'm not doing that many races right now. But I, I, I ran the 50 mile race, signed up for another one the next weekend, and then by the end of that year, I found out that I had run more 50 mile races than anybody in the world. Oh wow! I completed 20 50 50 mile races that one year. So yeah, I did just jump into it. But then I said, okay, so now I got to do hundreds. Okay, so the very <laughs> The very next year, I entered my first 100-mile race and was super excited about it. I had a great time doing it. I, I, I didn't get sick. I didn't get killed. I didn't overdo it or anything like that. I had fun the entire time. And then again, that year, I found out that I broke the world record for the most 100-mile races run in a year. Oh you know, God. without even knowing there was a record. Okay. And also, <laughs> I, I won awards like the Grand Slam of Ultra Running and the uh, last great race on earth, which is wars very few people in the sport get, but I'm the first person in the world to ever get it the very first year they ran hundreds. Yeah. Okay. And, and so, so yeah, a lot of people build up to it, but I just, I was just too addicted to the idea. And so, yeah. and, and you and your wife are featured. Oh, she's, she's a, she, yeah, she, we met in races. So uh -huh. yeah, and y'all are American. featured in a documentary called the high. Yes. Uh, we're both nuts. Okay. So, so she, she, she one time, she, so, so there's a race called Badwater. Okay. Which is a race through Death Valley in the middle of summer. Temperatures get up to hundred degrees, 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Uh, we both, I, I did it. Uh, cause I was just addicted to the idea. I had to do it. It was 135 miles. It starts from the lowest point of, uh, the United States, which is Badwater, a place right. called Badwater. FL and it ends at the highest point in the United States called Mount Whitney, uh -huh. the continental United States. And uh, uh, so I did that race, and <clears throat> my future wife at the time was crewing for me at the time, but she wanted to do it. So she and I both did it the next year. <clears throat> and then this guy from India contacts her and says, You know, I'm so impressed that you did that race. Would you like to come and run a race that I'm putting together in the Himalayas? They call it the Himalayas, not the yeah. Himalayas. Uh, in the Himalayas, it's a race that's going to go over an eighteen thousand foot peak. And my wife said, "Yeah, go on, I do it." And then <laughs> she, she told me about it. And I said, "Yeah, I want to do it too." And and then it turns out we talked to the race director. The race director couldn't find anybody else that wanted to do it. We were the only two that wanted to do it. And I only did crazy enough to do it. They found one other person, a guy from England named Mark Cobain. Uh, and so uh, then, then the race director, his name is Rajet Cajon, uh, he ended up making it harder by having to go over two 18,000 foot peaks, made it 138 miles long, nonstop. Uh, the lowest elevation was for a short period of time at 11,000 feet. Okay. And, uh, uh, my wife and I and Mark were the very first people to do it. And it's in this documentary called The High. Mm -hmm. um, uh, both, we both ran into problems, which uh, I ended up having a gallbladder attack at about 50 miles and had to go to the hospital. And, uh, so I didn't finish the race. Molly, Molly, my wife, Molly, got, got uh, uh, her crew got lost her. They couldn't find her. And uh, so she ran out of water and got very dehydrated. And she had to be taken to the hospital. And then a guy in the hospital bed next to her died from altitude sickness, which uh, was not too motivating. But when she, when she learned from the race director that I had been, had, had, I was in the hospital, uh, she withdrew from the race. And so Mark Cobain was the only one that finished. So oh he, he, made, he made the reality of this real, okay? Because yeah. everybody said it was impossible to do a race like that. So, but Molly went back and did it, finished. I went back and did it, and I finished. Um, Molly and I actually got married at 18,000 feet elevation. That in, is so awesome. In, yeah, in, in the Himalayas. Uh, but that, there's yeah, the documentary, watch it, it's called The High. The High. And we'll uh, have a link to that in the show notes, but it's on YouTube. Yeah. Um, and then you're in another documentary called The Immortalist with That's Aubrey it. de Grey. Yes. And that's fascinating. We'll also have that in the show notes. And I believe there's another new one coming out. Is there not? Uh, 
Longevity Hackers uh, is coming out. There's there's a few documentaries that I've been in. There's there's the first one I was in was called Immortal, uh, which sounds a little a lot like the name of the Immortal List, but they're two yeah. different documentaries. Okay. Um, and uh, the Immortalist, the, the Immortal actually won an Emmy. Okay. Um, okay. The Immortalist almost got an Oscar. Okay, for best new documentary. Nice. But we're actually very entertaining. Okay, they and uh, Aubrey and I had a lot of fun doing that uh, that documentary, and of course my wife's in them too, uh, because she's my wife is I don't want to mention her age, but she looks twenty years younger than she is, and she's super athletic and super healthy, and I think she's the model example everybody wants to be. Yeah, like her age. Um, she so and good. I will become besties. I will figure out all of her secrets. <laughs> <laughs> more and more famous than I am in the old world. Okay. And now her daughter is actually, her daughter has completed the Western States 100. By the way, I, I mentioned I wanted to, I, I finished the Western States 100. Uh, my daughter, my Molly's daughter, most of my stepdaughter has done it now too. Nice. Uh, but all the families become ultra marathoners. That is awesome. I don't think I'm going to be joining you on the ultra marathon running race, but we are, uh, my husband and I are, are getting into high altitude hiking and climbing and Mount Whitney is on our list. We've got a little ways to go to work up to that. But Mount I did, Whitney I is did on it our twice list. in one day. I know. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I have to work on my acclimatization because I, I did get a little altitude sick at 10 five. So Alto Labs. There's a thing. Google Alto A L T O L A B. They they sell a device. That will make it so you can go to the top of Mount Everest, okay, without having any altitude problems. Okay. And that's so when, when I when I first and every time I've gone to the Himalayas to run up there, I've used this device for like three months in advance. Okay. Uh, and it just works beautifully. A lot of other runners, especially a guy named Ray Sanchez, has used it too, uh, and has done really well. But I proved to myself that it really made a difference because when I First flew to India, and it was practically sea level. And then it was in Delhi, and then got in an airplane and flew up to 11,000 feet at the town called Leh, L-E-H. The first thing I did was get into a taxi cab and have them drive up to the highest motorable pass in the world, which is called Kardum Law. It was 18,500 feet elevation. They drove me up immediately there. And I got out and I ran, and I ran uphill. Okay, well, having any problems at all. When everywhere I looked, I saw people lying on the ground. Yes. <laughs> being altitude sick. So this, this thing really works. Alto Labs is the best thing in the world for, for training for high altitudes. Okay, I will look that up. I'll put a, show, a link on the show notes to you guys for that because I'm sure I'm not the only one. Um, Bill, is there anything else that you would like to share with us on your regimen on health span on future research uh i mean i do take a lot of supplements okay and Me too. <laughs> uh, I, I used to i used to give talks and talk all about the supplements i take and why i take each one and stuff like that <clears throat> and then dr sandra kaufman mm -hmm. uh, published a book called the kaufman protocol and I read that book and I thought that's the most brilliant book. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so now instead of telling everybody about all the supplements I take, I just say, I follow everything that Kaufman protocol says. Yeah. And she's come out with another book too. Now uh, that even goes into more detail, but it's, it's not just, it, it's, it's formulas. I mean, it's like, like you have these like, ways of deciding which supplements you should take. She tells you exactly how to do this. She, she, she gives you scoring systems and stuff like that. It's all, and, and she understands it all immensely well. Okay. Yeah. And that's what really sold me when I read the book. Uh, so now my supplement regimen is what Sandra Kaufman says. Okay. And, uh, uh, and I, I do take a few other prescription drugs because of Everybody has genetic variations. That of course. Make so I, but, but otherwise the supplements, I, and I take a lot of supplements. And every time Sandy, Sa Sandra Coffin 
comes up with something new and lets me know I, I add that to my list. <laughs> so that's awesome. Yeah, I have I have two drawer fulls of supplements that I like bounce between all the time. My husband just laughs at me at half the time. But yeah, it's it's imperative because I mean, while we we are not able to, you know, cure aging quite yet, we can slow it down. And the hopes of having a longer health span, staying healthier longer and enjoying the life that we're living. That's the absolute most important thing that people should be doing now. Yeah. Okay. Doing whatever they can to slow down their aging. And I mean, don't smoke. Uh, it's, it's like, that's one of the, all smokers that have been smoking their lives look older than their friends are same age that don't smoke. Um, but there's so many things that people do that accelerate their aging. And a lot of times they think, well, let's, why not? Because I'm not going to live forever. Well, start thinking to yourself, you might just live forever. Okay. That's what I believe. I believe, I, I don't know if forever is a real word, but uh, I'm going to live as long as I can. That's for sure. Right. And I'm going to enjoy every moment of it because I love living. Yeah. Living is an adventure. Yeah. Um, and uh, I love adventure. <laughs> that's absolutely, absolutely. Now, Sierra Sciences is your company, yes. and um, we'll be having a link to that on our show notes as well. Um, but the website is www.sierra.no, S-I-S-C-I.com. So uh, it's Sierra, still for Sierra Sciences, and Sierra is like named after the Sierra Mountains. Right. Uh, so Sierra, because we're right, I'm looking right at the Sierra Mountains right now when I look out my front window. Nice. Um, it's uh, SierraSci.com. And, and there, in there, you know, there's a lot of videos, uh, there's documents like talking about my background and my history. And it, it, it's like, there's a lot of information there. It, it's, I just don't want people to be disappointed because I don't specialize in having the most, uh, sexy website in the world. I just, uh, you I, are a very, scientist, very informative website. Yeah. Yes. Now, if somebody, say somebody is watching this, um, a company is watching this, and they're interested in learning more about getting involved in an investment kind of way, um, they, they can look at your websites, they can contact you on your website. I have my cell phone number on the past. <laughs> oh, my, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I do want to hear from such people. But you know what? I also want ambassadors. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm not a marketer. I need people to be going out to spread the word, to, to approach investors. I pay finder's fees. And a lot of people are collecting finder's fees right now from me, from, from bringing me go-to-market partners or investors and things like that. Uh, but that's what I need. I need people, ambassadors to be working with me. They will benefit tremendously from it. But uh, as, as I said, Good scientists don't make good marketers. And I am, I'm, I'm really, I get excited when I speak on stage because I love educating audiences, but I, I tend to always forget my, my main goal is I got to find funding to get the research done. And, yeah. um, it's, uh, but that's, but I, ambassadors can help. And I do have a lot of ambassadors, but I, I need a lot, lot more. Well, there you go. And we have a lot of influencers that listen to this show. Um, of course, you know, I will be a, a wonderful ambassador, a willing ambassador for you as well. Um, Bill, thank you so much for being on the show today, for sharing your insight, your wisdom, a glimpse into where aging is heading, all of your research on telomerase. We're excited to watch as you discover the cure for aging. And if y'all have any questions about the show, head over to Instagram at Becoming Angels Podcast, drop your questions under this show's podcast. And if you want to catch up with me, you can find me all over social media at um, Robin Lynn everywhere, R-O-B-Y-N-N-L-I-N. And um, I share my own tips for living agelessly as well as decreasing bioage and increasing health span. And of course, our show website is becomingagelesspodcast.com where you can catch up with past episodes. And I encourage you to subscribe to stay in the know. Please consider sharing with your friends. And um, of course, as I mentioned, all links that we talked about will be in the show notes. So you guys, thank you. Thank you, Bill, for being with us today. And um, I hope you'll join me here next time on Becoming Ageless as we uncover new tips, tricks, science, actions to increase your whole 
health health span. Thank you, guys. Bill, thank you so very thank, much. Thank you, Robin. I had fun. Me All right. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you enjoy this episode, learning more about Dr. Andrews, his research on telomeres and telomerase, and took note of the three pillars that he suggests to increase our health span while we wait on deeper scientific answers. These pillars will be discussed in our blog for this show, which is found on our website, becomingagelesspodcast.com. Dr. Andrews would like to extend an invitation to potential investors to collaborate with Sierra Sciences, reinforcing the importance of collective efforts and unraveling the secrets behind aging. In our show notes, you'll find contact info for Dr. Andrews, Sierra, Sci- Sierra Sciences, a few of the documentaries in which Bill has been featured, as well as additional information on our show. Please rate the show and give us some love on IG. A review, every comment helps us to reach more people with the news that health span is the goal and should be the one that we focus on as we get older. Thank you guys so much for joining us and I look forward to seeing you on the next show. Stay ageless, y'all.